Mike and Luke, um, Mike Steinfeld, Luke Burglar, I've had the pleasure to work with these guys for a couple years. Uh, they farm outside of Ridgeway, and we've, we've all been on a soil health journey. Uh, these guys have been trying lots of different things. Uh, we've also been able to travel um, the country together, and they'll probably allude to some of that as well. We went out to Gabe Brown's uh, this past June and down to Ray Archuleta's in October. And so they've, they've been learning a lot of different things about uh, not only row crop, but also grazing. And um, you're gonna hear from them. So guys, I'm gonna give you, let's see, give you guys this, and I'm gonna let you guys take it away. All right, I am Mike Steinfeld. Um, I farm near Ridgeway. I gotta figure all this out. I'm a farmer, I'm not a presenter, so <laughs> we, gotta, we gotta work our way through this. Um, that's my family. Uh, like I said, I'm near Ridgeway, two miles north of Ridgeway. Uh, we run corn, soybeans, cover crops, we graze a lot. Wife and my four daughters are involved. Um, I also have a friend of mine that farms with me, Richard Kaler, and a cousin that we all run cattle together with. Um, one thing I have noticed by doing it is keeping the family involved. Uh, my kids love making fence. And they, every time I ask them, they're right there. So. Uh, being, we now are moving towards this adaptive grazing, we make a lot of fence. I mean, I have, yeah? Yeah, push it down. Okay. Uh, we do make a lot of fence. Uh, I've had cows this year on our farm where I've never seen cows before, so. I like it, I, I really like that. Um, one thing my kids always say, and it's kind of funny being a beef farmer, you know, we'll be making supper, dinner, and having steak, and they'll come in the house and say, steak again? <laughs> kind of different. <laughs> I really like this slide. Uh, if you want to make small changes, change the way you do things. If you want to make major changes, change the way you see things. Uh, I, I've learned over the past few years, observation is, is a big thing and how you're looking at your operation or what you're doing can change things. And success is not always what you see. Uh, over the past few years, we have definitely noticed more rainfall, more erosion. One of my main goals is to stop erosion on my farm. Uh, I like to use cover crops to do that. Um, mainly got into cover crops to feed the cows and then figured out, hey, we're holding soil back and, and it's helping with our whole situation. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Luke. There's a lot of people out here, Mike. <laughs> um, good morning. Uh, like Mike said, I'm Luke. Uh, it's my family. Um, three daughters. Uh, a little younger than Mike's children. And so they actually do like building tents so far. Um, I'm not sure what's in our water in Ridgeway because there's seven daughters between the two of us. Um, I'm about 50 mama cows with all the young stock, uh, corn, soybeans, sorghum, uh, small grain crops for feed. Uh, been a rotational grazer for probably 10 years uh, in a transition to uh, adaptive grazing. I've been doing rye and sorghum and all them things before, I guess they put a term cover cropper on it. So I don't know if I was ahead of my time or just didn't know what I was doing yet. I think with that, we are just going to jump right in. Two pictures from my farm. 
You know, it's the worst day of chopping corn ever. And when you have to fill ditches to get the sprayer across, you have issues. So what I'm gonna ask you is, what's going on here? What do you got? What's the issue there? Bingo. Five years ago, I used to complain about the weather, and there was too much rain and a runoff problem. Going back to Mike's slide of how you see things, that's an infiltration problem. I cannot handle the water I get. That's the end result of issues like that. It starts costing me a lot of money to try to put it back together. And I just am tired of that. So we started changing the way we do things. We like to use the six principles of soil health. One is armor the soil. Two is minimize disturbance, increase plant diversity, keep a living root in the soil, integrate livestock and grazing, and make it work for your context. Um, I guess one of the big questions on that is context sometimes. So let's consider that um, your location, your resources, and your needs, whether that's feed, grazing, uh, and so forth. I really like plant diversity, um, mainly because I'm seeing it now and the more diverse plants that I've seen, the different reactions the soil has towards that. If I picked mine off the list, I think uh, not always my favorite, but the most challenging for me, and I like that challenge, is trying to keep the living root in the soil. Um, in our climate, you know, we'll freeze out in November, don't unthaw till April, um, but it keeps my mind working and uh, we're seeing what's possible. Armor on the soil. Um, this is actually off of Luke's farm and you can see in between the soybeans here where the armor is. Uh, he had seeded rye down 40 to 50 pounds of the acre on this. That uh, photo was taken roughly July, August, so we still had good coverage. When the beans came off the end of October, um, I hired all the harvesting done. The gentleman that was in the combine, he come in that night and he says, Luke, do you have some sort of grass problem or something in your beans? Because there's one giant mat of dead stuff in between and I can't even see the dirt. And I said, bingo, that's what I'm after. <laughs> This is my first time planting green. Uh, as you can see, uh, I'm planting into rye. Um, I couldn't get the trench to shut. And you can see the beans there. Uh, I didn't know what to do, so I called Luke. And Luke said, don't do it. He said, they'll never grow. It ain't, it ain't gonna work. You better figure something out. So I called another guy, I called Willie Erdman, and Willie says, what are you worried about? It's gonna rain tonight, that'll slough right over and they'll be fine, and it worked. And to clarify, I probably didn't say it quite so nicely, don't do it. <laughs> um, that's where my life began with covers. Uh, that was the following spring after that tore up silage field I had a previous picture of. Um, a lot of things I watched Mike go, I too, I don't care how much pressure I had, I don't care what kind of closing apparatus I had, I could about see every bean in every trench, but I wasn't looking back because I was not going to work that down or try to change anything. 
if I can make one note about this picture, something not to do, that rye was planted at 100 pounds with the intention to make for feed, but it was so wet in there, I didn't want to tear it up with my hanging equipment, so we put beans in it, and uh, 100 pound rye planting it is it's thick as hair on a dog. It was made it even a little bit more challenging. And soon after that, I realized um, I maybe need a GPS screen or something because it gets very interesting out there. <laughs> so, some of the economics of planting soybeans green. Uh, we have the $9 an acre at a 50 pound rate. $15 in no-tilling, $15 or $15 in no-till the rye, $15 to plant the soybeans. Your seed costs, which I understand can vary depending where you source your soybeans, your chemical application, and your chemical. $126.86. When we go back to conventional, um, right in the ballpark of $34 for two tillage passes. <coughs> The same cost to plant them, soybean seed, another $10 because I was so anal about everything being flat and level and perfect, $10 it cost me for the roller. First chemical pass with application, there was always a second chemical pass with application because we had tilled that ground and stirred up all the weed seeds. Not to mention the soil loss. And for anybody who's ever picked rock, what is that worth not to do that anymore? Um, total there, 189.72. I saved $62.86 an acre. If I never hooking up the soil finisher, the plow, or anything, putting a planter on the ground in some green cover and going for it. And what about your yield? What about it? How was it? Was it worse? better? Well, I can tell you what, I had probably never been so nervous, but that's what happens when the corn, or when the combine shows up. We did 54.9 bushel acre. I have that as a three-year average. My conventional soybeans, 55.1 on a five-year average. I lost two-tenths of a bushel. I can't pay for that on a 60-some dollar savings. That's just easy math. Plus, I have no water now. I've never had to get into what I call the harsh chemicals of Flexstar and Cobra and have all the neighbors point fingers at me because my beans look like they're dying in July. I'm feeding my biology and my next year's crop. And if I had to say it again, I really don't like rock picking. <laughs> And not to pick on Mike, but it's getting harder to find young guys to pick rock when his daughters are in their swimming suits in my swimming pool. They, <laughs> they lose their focus. So now we're no telling and not picking rock. But the girls are still swimming. So. Uh, one thing I have to add to that is I too all had to spray my conventional bean two, sometimes three times. I got into a flush of ragweed in my one bean crop that was totally devastating. So. Go ahead. Um, some of the more benefits of planting green, you know, if we're increasing water infiltration, uh, armoring, armoring the soil, nutrient cycling, reducing our erosion. If you can see this figure up here, I don't know if you can in the back of the room, increased water, water infiltration. If you're under a full tillage system, you're looking at a half to one inch of rainfall per hour. Under no-till practice with covers, you're looking at taking in three to 10 inches an hour. And we're all fairly local. We know that three inches can come within that first hour. So why not be ready for it? One of the other things we have done uh, is 
working on building our own interceder. So that's what we call the start of our trendsetter. Um, we use it as, uh, what we did, I guess, is uh, I got a six row rotary hole from a friend of mine. I had to trade him six corn, six corn stalk bales for it. Um, we got that, we purchased a candy air box, mounted that to it and made it so we could go in between our corn rows, basically removing some of our rotor units. It's just another picture of it. Um, one thing is we worked on this for what, almost a year and a half to get it to work. Um, nights, weekends, we would try to collaborate on it, working together and putting it to work, I guess. Which, by working together too, it, it, it made it more viable because we've had the discussion. I don't know if either one of us would have went it alone, you know, just uh, for the expense reasons. And um, Mike's a machinist, so that's very, very handy and I have a I have a knack for trading used parts for beer or brandy or whatever they have to have for them. So um, we're, we're in this pretty cheap. So the what we call the trend center, our candy air box on a rotary hole, um, doubles as our frost seeder. Um, that was our first attempt. That's uh, that day was 4 a.m back on a township road and um, we said we're gonna we're gonna try this out cold that morning so we're all excited I'm excited just because I had a tractor that started and uh, we meet up at Mike's and we're really excited to put some oats down with it first we had this all figured out and uh, I had a GPS system for the tractor by then and uh, so we at least know where we're going and we were so excited, we bought some bin run oats for six bucks, and I thought, boy, do we have a deal. Well, I tell you what comes with bin run oats is a whole bunch of corn that got swept in. But we can't meter corn through the meters of this. So we spent about the two, first two hours of our day sorting kernels of corn out of our oats just to try, try our new toy. So lesson learned. Uh, this is some of the results. The oats did come, they were they were poking through uh, and it worked. One other thing that morning, you know, it's five, five thirty in the morning and all of a sudden we see some lights coming and they stop and they're watching us go across the field. Oh well, here's my dad, my uncle. And they're like, What are you guys doing? I was actually riding in the gandy box trying to see if everything was working, it was kind of a nightmare. It's quite a show of me trying to hold my back window open, holler at Mike over this screaming hydraulic motor. And I'd go around a corner or I'd hit a big bump and I'd have to look back and I couldn't see Mike because he went down in the box to make sure everything's working. <laughs> After a while, I just figured I'd see him on the ground on the next round if it didn't work <laughs> um, Roughly the second week of June, there is corn in there, just to give you a scope of uh, how, how tall they are. Um, that's uh, 35 pounds oats planted on the 23rd of March. Um, there's a bit of a learning curve to do, but it's, uh, it's, it's not terribly tough. And this far north, I see it as our best, uh, our best avenue behind grain corn when, um, when it's tough to get in, especially like this year. You know, we were already froze up a lot of us when Along with the cover is having a plan. This is my corn. It was frost seeded oats. And you can see I wasn't on the ball. There was snow in here when we had uh, frost seeded it. So not everything worked perfectly, but we did, uh, we did take a yield hit on this, um, but it worked out. We're still here to talk about it, so.
we had a learning experience. And when you get to this point, that's when you finally figure out who the same three or four trucks are that drive by every day because they spotted you at five in the morning doing something and you refuse to answer their phone. And they drive by once every three, four days and now they're starting to put it all together. Oh yeah. Um, if you do have a question, just raise your hand and uh, we'll see if we can answer them or not. This was my first attempt at interceding uh, because we didn't have the Gandhi running yet. I did want to get something in. This was in 2018 on July 3rd. I just went out there with a hand seeder and threw some radishes and turnips out and it did come, but it didn't stay there. The corn did shade that out. So after doing that, I did have some thoughts on the interceding that it maybe wouldn't work but we went for it anyway the following year with the machine. Um, and it seemed to work. Just, uh, just check in progress here. Uh, to do a project like this that you're not very familiar with, for me, every day when I come out of the house before I go to my off-farm job, I'd run out to that field like a kid on Christmas morning, just hoping it'd show up. And uh, it just it was a lot of fun to watch it. And then it did actually show up, so we knew it could it could work. Um, I think this should be at my place. This right hand side was under one pass of shallow tillage. This left hand side is uh, no till. So it, it works on, on, on both planes. Um, we did put in, what did we have, 15-way mix on that, uh, mainly ryegrass, we had clovers in there. Um, you got your radish and your kale and your turnip, uh, a blend of clovers uh, that are account for uh, like roughly six species. Um, 23rd of July. This is when it gets really exciting for us because one of the main purposes was looking at uh, feed for the cattle when they go to the stocks and starting to realize that this is a, a viable adventure. I did on my ground, the kale was predominantly what had came. I was hoping for more of a ryegrass, but there again, the diversity kind of, some things seemed to take over more than others. This is my girls actually in Luke's interceded corn uh, by October. And it, this is kind of what was left. Some pretty good sized radishes and turnips. That's the day the combine showed up. You can see um, ground cover in between every row. And uh, that gets me really excited because there is uh, a lot of added value and uh, a lot of tonnage out there to uh, to be grazed. So it, uh, at that point, I considered it uh, a success. This is at my place. I think it survived this time because we went at it earlier. Uh, the year before that corn was chest high and it was shaded out very soon. There was spots that it did survive the year before, which gave me hope, but we just kind of looked at it and said, hey, we've got we to get on the ball here and get after it. So. We, did. We, we ran at roughly a, a B3 stage and I apologize, we don't, have any viable video or any real good pictures of that running, but I'm usually driving and Mike's bouncing around in the air seater, so we had no way to take pictures. But this was at my place and you can see it got covered up with snow when we were taking it out, but it, it was still there. Um, 
I didn't get 100% of what I wanted out of it because the snow covered it up. I still turned the cows out there and they did a good job of digging through the snow for it, so. What do you use for chemicals that you don't plant chill in your cover crop at the same time? That you don't have the residual and the, that, that's a real science in knowing what to use. You're exactly right, it's a real I don't science. I hear that in back. <laughs> I don't the, think hear my the question was what uh, what's a chemical program as far as residuals or anything like that so it doesn't uh, hamper the, the growth of your covers um, if I had that science I would be fairly wealthy I think um, I push the easy button on it I put a pass around them across everything and with anticipation to be in there a few days later with the inner cedar uh, we got extremely wet and it took about two weeks. I can honestly say, yes, I had some weeds, but I will tell you it wasn't enough to bother me. Um, I would still consider it a, a success, but at least once a week, my brain is focusing on where, where the chemical needs to be. We tried, uh, I tried to test strip with uh, that had Acuron on it because I talked to other guys that Acuron can work and I didn't have the best results with it. So mm -hmm. we just keep learning and, and trying to figure it out. I think the biggest thing to get ahead of the weeds would be, uh, would be rotation. Just keep moving it around. So this is a few numbers on our return on our investment. We had our 15 way mix at $32 an acre, $10 for application. We did 20 acres. And it, you know, total of 840 bucks into it. For us with the cattle, being feed is our main focus. This is how we break it down. We pull 35 days grazing. That's equivalent for us to 70 bales of hay. At $80 a bale, that's $5,600 in feed. Uh, you break that out with 20 acres, that's $280 an acre in added feed value or value in feed. This is the one that caught me almost a little off guard until I realized what I had, and it was supplement tubs. That's a check I have to write every fall when I turn the cows to stocks, and I didn't have to write that check. An additional $37.50 an acre on supplementation versus the straight corn stocks, and I had nutritionists out there right by my side confirming what I believe and what I see and said, you're good, you need to go for it. At 317.50 an acre on 20 acres, that's $6,350 in feed. We did not have to put on the ground for the cows. And as a bonus, I had my corn yield. After I've had the success in this, I honestly look at the corn as the second crop now. Some of the other benefits that go along with the interseeding, uh, you are gaining the water infiltration, armor, nutrient cycle, reducing erosion. The biggest thing that we look at is the grazing, but you also could have the opportunity to plant back into that green, you know, with a soybean crop or another corn crop. All right, change in direction of the journey. One of the big things for us is networking. Um, that's kind of how we got started. Stumbled upon more of what we know, interceding, what to do. Created this whole group of people to learn and share and bounce questions off of and complain to and, and, and everything else. Maybe even having the occasional beer with. So, networking is everywhere. The whole list is there. Friends, buddies, neighbors, take a trip, come to a field day, just like you guys did, or a meeting. Um, consult your local SWCD if you want to talk to Lance. Um, read a book, 
YouTube's huge. Um, I'm a guy that can't even run a computer. I've owned a computer for two years. I just broke it out this week to try to build this slideshow. Um, it was still new in box. So I have this whole new set of eyes for YouTube because, well, we're even out there now. Um, there's no excuses. Every day there's more and more of us out here doing this kind of stuff. Uh, it is unmeasurable. I mean, there's, there's so much on uh, everywhere about it now. I mean, I watch YouTube on a daily basis for grazing. Uh, we did have a field day. We had an interceding field day. Um, we didn't think 15 people were going to show up to see what we were doing, but we did get 75 people there. Um, it was quite impressive. I also had a grazing field day or a pasture walk here. Um, it was it was interesting. Uh, just with the networking and the questions and, and getting to know different people and what different people are doing or their ideas of it. And everybody is extremely willing to share. Um, it's almost like a whole new world where there aren't any, any secrets or um, anything like that. Everybody just uh, is willing to help out and uh, like these, this field day was a, was a huge success and a huge, uh, huge learning opportunity for the both of us. That's just a picture. That's the fruits of our labor, I call it, with our manager Lance there. Um, I gotta give him a little heck about that because he tries to keep us on track some days. So. Never stop learning. That was our trip to Gabe Brown's ranch, Bismarck, North Dakota. Bunch of people had talked about it, and I said, why don't we just go do it? We had to pay him for a day-long tour, lunch. It's probably some of the best money I ever spent. Um, it was a huge eye-opener, and it really, for me, helped connect the dots on the path we're going down. Just really helped bring some things together. Uh, for me, the trip to Gabe's, kind of caught me off guard a little bit. We walk in there, he's got a little cabin type thing. We sat down and we're just introducing ourselves, getting to know each other. And he says, I don't know why you guys are here. I'm not doing anything special. That kind of caught me off guard because Gabe Brown is a guru of soil health. So. <laughs> One of the other things we did is we did uh, go to a grazing school or class down in Seymour, Missouri. It was through the Soil Health Academy. I mean, that was really an eye opener for me. We had, you know, a hundred head locked up in a third of an acre here, learning how to use them to take care of what was there, because as far as armoring the soil and doing that, you're looking at more of a trampoline effect and trying to get some of that carbon on the ground for the next growing season. Um, it, was, it was a real learning experience for me. It was a fun road trip, and um, so I'm sure some of you in the room know some of these guys, but when you can take Dr. Ellen Williams, Ray Archuleta, Gabe Brown, and Shane New, and put them all at your disposal for an entire week, it's worth whatever you have to pay to do it. Because them guys will forget more about regen agriculture than I'll ever learn. So we see it again. Um, six principles of soil health. Uh, coming up here in one second. I have a video here. Uh, I took it my place grazing some covers and uh, We're going to show you all six right in one place The title is learn to observe You're going to see my daughter my middle daughter make an appearance here and um, 
Well, you'll, you'll see what happens. That makes my day. That's that's an eight-year-old girl. I, I tell you what, we started on this path. I can honestly say I haven't had the opportunity to spend as much time with my children that I have in the past. And that one in particular, she is her father's daughter. She's got it in her, and she's pulling wire. Um, you can see she uh, she's going to go back right right at it. Um, Learn to observe. What did we see in the video? 51 seconds. What did we pick up in one less than one minute? Very good. What else we have out there? You're really close. Very good. I said roughly 15 different species in, um, of crop there, and he's pretty close. Very good. Anybody know what the purple stuff is? Hairy vetch, you're right. Cows aren't supposed to graze that, are they? I like your answer. What's the white stuff, Lou? Buckwheat. Cows will actually leave that till last. I didn't know that. But I didn't mind that. The bees still had a place to go to on the buckwheat flowers. Um, it's coming up here in a few slides. You'll kind of see this, this track of land was a big mess and so we decided to take it a different direction and it, it, uh, it pays better dividends uh, letting the cows across it than uh, just trying to row crop it. <clears throat> um, I really like this slide. Uh, I don't know if any of you have been involved with the uh, uh, ranching management uh, but it says weeds are not a problem they are a symptom I got a lot of neighbors and they say all I feed my cows is weeds but they're not understanding what is all out there you know I put the cattle on the ground and they're they're self-propelled they go everywhere and they'll harvest everything. Um, they have four legs for a reason, and they spread the nutrients out for you. Yes, sir. What about compacting the cattle out there? I haven't seen a huge, the question was what about compaction with cattle? I haven't seen a huge influence of compaction, and from what I've been reading lately, a lot of, a lot of guys are saying that they're not compacting, they're massaging. I can't, that's about all I've seen. I haven't seen a compaction problem from cattle. If, if you can keep them moving and not let them trail back, central water source, central mineral source, however your program is set up, that's one of the things I really watch for. Keep them from tracking. Always keep them moving forward. You know, only let them come back for water. Say, uh, what I would say, two, two paddocks back and that's it. You have to keep the system moving forward. You must have uh, self propelled timbers in that ground, don't you? Oh, yes. Definitely, definitely have earthworms now. Yeah. My family yells at me because I look for earthworms now. 
Uh, this is a chunk of ground that, that we've been just playing around with. It's about five acres. Uh, it's real close to the building, so I can move the cattle in and out of it easily. Um, but I did plant, there's some succotash in here, some peas, uh, clovers. Uh, we just planted that for grazing. It worked out okay. It wasn't as profitable as I thought it was going to be. Our first round, you know, we had about $26 an acre into it. Um, we grazed it for, I believe it was 17 days. Um, I came back and replanted into it this 20 way mix, and I ran the entire herd across this for five days and it actually turned out to be more profitable than the succotash. Um, but as you can see, we do have some weeds out there, um, but there's a, there's a lot of diversity. I mean, down in the bottom of this, there was clover everywhere. It was, it was pretty fun to do. Title is it's all carbon. Carbon is everywhere in a lot of different forms. Okay. Take advantage of it. This is an overripe stand of native prairie that a gentleman wanted cut down. I'm not going to pass that up just because it's not what we would know as quality feed. It's still usable feed. So I, I'm, I'm taking it home. The only thing that could have beat this is if um, he'd have been a little closer to me and I could put the cows on it and let them do it themselves. <coughs> There are grazing opportunities everywhere. Um, this is actually all on my neighbors. We got back from Missouri and they had this chunk of ground that I've been watching, keeping my eye on, that they haven't pastured in probably 20 years. And when we came back, I realized that my pastures were quite depleted and I needed to move cattle. So I went and seen my neighbors. In two days, I had cattle over here with water ran over there. Now it does help that your daughter comes home late and needs a little adjustment. So she did help run water over there and fence and <laughs> it worked out quite well. We were able to graze this for, I think we were there for about seven days. And then I did talk them into taking this chunk of corn out and we moved up into that. Yeah, they took that for high moisture and I paid them to graze my cattle on their corn stalks. This is how I feed cows in the winter. I take the hay out there and I roll it out. I haven't uh, built up enough courage to just set the bales out there and bale graze, um, but I like it. it. It seems to work real well. You know, we're depositing fertilizer out here and the cows seem happy and it's working for me. Um, just to add a couple things, Mike on rolling the hay across the ground has been kind of fun to watch. Um, we have some pretty good discussions how or what sort of planter or drill we might get through all that residue. Um, I tried bale grazing for three days but I got sick of bringing the bales back to the top of the hill when the cows were rolling through the fence. So I need to tweak that. Um, just a real quick story. Um, because of the feedstuffs available and it's not an excuse, I hit the easy button because old habits die hard. I am, yeah, still feeding with my TMR. Just three, four nights ago, um, it should take me an hour or a little less to mix that batch and get it fed. I'm two and a half hours into feeding cows and I can't get feed out of the TMR yet. I'm laying on my back in 10 inches of snow. It's 11 degrees out. And my eight year old, the one you seen in the video, well, her legs are younger than mine. So she was making trips back and forth to the shed for wrenches and whatnot because I'm too stubborn just to pull it back to the yard. On her third trip back, I'm saying a few choice words, laying under the TMR, and she looks at me and she says, Dad. I said, what? She says, wouldn't it be a lot easier just to give the cows a hay bale? 
<laughs> you want to talk about an aha moment. <laughs> 37 years old, I've had cows since I've been 12, and I have an eight-year-old that sees it. And it's embarrassing. So our focus now is feeding both herds. You know, we gotta keep these girls going, but we gotta, we gotta aim for this. Uh, I had a neighbor stop by, he's a younger gentleman, and he's, I'm feeding right by the road here. And uh, he says, what are you doing? I said, I'm feeding cows. But why, why, why don't you feed them up by the buildings here? He said, you gotta, you gotta carry that hay out there with the skid loader. I'm like, yeah. He said, but I'm also feeding the soil. And he's like, I don't get it. Well, this kid's, he's outdoorsy, so he does a lot of fishing. I said, do you ever have a, a worm bed when you were a kid? He goes, yeah. I said, what did you do with that? He said, well, we throw all our, our scrap foods on it and we cover it up with straw and put water on it. I said, that's what I'm doing, feeding the worms. New topic, challenge everything, including yourself. Maybe what you hear, maybe what you read, Sometimes I don't believe everything in here. I'm a bit stubborn, so you can tell me something 10 times, but until I prove it to myself, it doesn't always have a lot of validity. One of, uh, one of my biggest things is trust my gut and try something. In my situation, if it doesn't work, it'll always make one of the positives to having cattle, we can either get a fence around it or we can mechanically harvest it if need be. Mike and I like this. We've never had a failure, just a learning experience or two. Um, I don't like the word fail. I prefer learning experience and yeah, we've, we've had some of them, um, but it just helps you better what you're doing. I can't count on both my hands how many times people said you cannot graze or feed hairy vetch, it's toxic. Let me tell you what, that's in round bale form, that was grazed. My dad comes along, my father's old school, but he likes what I'm doing. And he goes, what's all that purple crap growing out there? I said, it's hairy vetch. So what are you doing with it? He says, I'm going to feed it to cows. They like it. He says, no, it's toxic. It's supposed to kill them. <laughs> All right, he says, it'll probably work. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, was on the phone with a seed company one day, trying to source a legume to plant in with my sorghum sedan, millet, cowpea, what have you or a different viney plant. And uh, the woman on the phone says, um, I, don't, I don't think you can do that. I says, well, I have a four to 10 field pea mixed in already and it's binding up quite nicely, but I'd like to add to it. She says, no, that'll never work. You can't grow peas inside a sorghum. I says, ma'am, give me your cell phone number because I don't want to argue, I'll just prove it to you. So the point there is, even somebody at a seed dealership might say it can't be done, but we're doing it, and we're not the only ones doing it. it, it it's everywhere. I was told Crimson Clover wouldn't overwinter this far north. That was my first attempt. It is beautiful to look at. Cecilia, look at the pollinators on it. Um, Mike and I each had some of that show up. Mine showed up really well. Yeah, I put Cecilia in. Um... The first round, it, it didn't even show up. I grazed that off and I actually reseeded that chunk of ground down for another grazing attempt in the fall. And then I had Facelia all over. It was, it, it's just blows your mind. One of the things I 
call them excuses you run into is people say, well, I don't have that right tool. I don't have this, I don't have that. This is actually the field them cows are grazing. This is winterized vetch. That is not a roller crimper. That's a 30 foot brilliant roller that I have. And Glenn, it's the same one you run on your soybeans. Did it do 100% of what we wanted to do? I don't know if it did 100%, but it worked. It killed the rye, it didn't kill the vetch. I got to prove to myself vetch didn't kill the cows. So in the end, it was a win. Um, there it is there. That is, uh, that's Mike's tractor and drill. And I made one, one round with that roller and he weighed me down. He says, we can't do that because I have no idea where I'm going or no idea where I've been. He said, so uh, we actually rolled it down after, after the drill went through. And it wasn't that easy to see where I was going with it was standing even. Uh, but I'm always up for a challenge. Is that a no-till drill? That is a no-till drill. Two of my daughters, uh, this is our second pass through on, uh, actually on the field where the video was shot. And uh, every day the one on the right, she's the eight year old. She runs around with me and, and she's got her big sister with her. And she says, look at all these vegetables. And they thought that was great. They're gonna pick them up and I don't think they understand there's 50 mama cows gonna start following around. But <laughs> I stopped and took a picture, and this uh, one on the right, she says, you know what, Dad? This is what? She goes, are we vegetable farmers that have cows, or are we still cow farmers and we're just growing vegetables? She says, I don't quite get it. So when, a, when an eight-year-old can pick up on that stuff, I say it again. It's almost a little embarrassing that um, you almost get your blinders on and, and maybe don't observe everything uh, everything you should be. If you haven't done it, pick up this book and read it. it it's, a, it's a good read. I bought it. I couldn't put it down. It was just too close to home for me. Um, I would suggest it very highly. I graduated in 2001 did my best not to read anything while I was in high school. <laughs> this is the first book I read since high school, believe it or not, and I read it in three nights. And um, there again, really helps put the pieces of the puzzle together and uh, start, start connecting the dots. It is by far the best $15 you could spend in this industry. I came by this again the other day and uh, I told our manager we had to have this up here. It says, you do not pay tax on money that you save. Just let that sink in and think about it. That's all we got. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, 